Ahmed Laidi, welcome to the Good Folks Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks. I'm great. Uh, so it's been a while since I wanted to have you in the podcast because ah, I think you. that you're one of my favorite people that I like talking to. Thank you very and much. And it's like one of those, I, I, I have with you those, those conversations where the talking never stops, like <laughs> a topic after another. Um, so I met you for the first time in MUN. I think a lot of yeah. people don't know exactly what you do. Can you just come up with a brief, brief description of who you are? Okay, my name is Ahmed. I live here in Algiers. Uh, I studied biology in the beginning of my university or academic life and then I studied agriculture, studied politics, I studied mm, many topics related to either biology or social sciences. Then uh, I came back to Algeria, I lived in Greece for one year, then I came back to Algeria and my activity is basically around um, academia, uh, generally I mean, and civic participation or civic initiatives. So in general this is who I am. Yeah, you're also interested in political philosophy. Oh, really? I am. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's 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 like, in my vision, that's the highest of all of all knowledge, like the political philosophy, or at least the political uh, big ideas of politics. You know, like the politics. Last time, World Youth Forum in December last yeah. year in Egypt, when yeah. I was there, I met an American and, uh, and uh, he asked me this question. He said, like, what do you think is the best form of uh, government? And then uh, I was like. I was thinking that, okay, so this conversation is going to shift to capitalism or socialism uh, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But then he, he surprised me. He was like, I'm going <coughs> to give you the answer. It's a benevolent dictator. So <laughs> someone who wants good, but yeah. he, he also doesn't listen to other, like he doesn't get distracted. Yeah. You know, yeah. because sometimes, I don't know, like not only in politics, but when you're running teams, yeah. right? Yeah. Sometimes you have the right opinion. Yeah, um, but you don't you don't want to enforce that opinion. So you want to listen to the others. Yeah, but it will take you a long time to listen to others True. and debate them True. and make them see the light. And uh, so you're yeah. like, uh, no, 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 I'm not going to listen to everything. Say, I'm going to do what's in my yeah. mind. Yeah. Sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. If you're right, then they're going to say yeah. he's a genius. But if you're wrong, then they're going to say he's a. They're going to drop it all on you. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So it's a. Uh, it's it's a problem when you're running a team between you want to be a good team leader, be listening to the other members and having a conversation yeah. with them between you want to do something, and also you don't want to waste time and you want yeah. to the the execution. You want things to be implemented. You want to achieve yeah. the goals. You don't want to keep wasting time. You know, yeah. consulting other people. This discussion. I don't know, I, I, where are you standing? On, on this that? discussion is really as old as Plato and Socrates. Now, if you go to the old literature, you would find that f since the beginning of of the political philosophy, people were thinking about what is the best regime to run a city. Now, back at that time, it wasn't the states and it wasn't like countries and states and everything. Yeah. It was a city. So Athens was like a, a country, an independent country. And back at that time, there was a good uh, philosopher, uh, Thucydides. He spoke about the war between the Spartans and the Athenians. Now we know that war through movies. We know th this is Sparta. Yes. Yeah, this is the, this is what we know about it. However, if you go deep into history, you would find that there was a big war between. Is it the movie Three Hundred? Yeah, 700? exactly, exactly. Now, if you go back to war uh, to, to 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 history, you'd find that there was a big war between between Athena and Sparta, and then from that point started uh, like people started to think, what is the best regime? Now. When you think about the best regime, you have clear options. You can have a tyranny. You can have a democracy, maybe. You can have an oligarchy where the wealthy rule the place. You can have many different types of regime, but democracy was the regime which was adopted in Athens back at that time. Right. Now, democracy has its advantages, but we cannot deny that democracy had, ha has its disadvantages. disadvantages. Thank you very much. Now, the advantages, okay, we all uh, have a share in deciding what happens to the country maybe okay fine but uh, we all for example give opinions and our opinions are taken seriously in decision making concerning the country now the question is who said our opinions are right this is the real question plato uh, uh, socrates for example was executed in athens based on democracy people voted that he was corrupt in the youth now after centuries of socrates we still read Socrates until today and he was not basically corrupt in the youth. He was he was uh, kind of cultivating a new ideology there. He's another decision in, in old Athens. There was a general, his name is Alcibiades. 
Alcibiades was leading the campaign of the Athenians, which was going to Sicily. They were trying to occupy Sicily, which was a crazy decision because at that time they were already at war with Sparta. So after uh, Pericles, the king of Athens, after he died, people started to doubt everything. Like they thought that everyone now is going to try to take his place because of personal motives and because of different reasons, right? So they were suspicious of everything. First of all, Socrates was off the table. Second thing, Alcibiades was the second best general in the Athenian army, right? What they did is that they called Alcibiades from the front line and then uh, they accused Alcibiades of having private motives to rule Athens and that he wanted to make a tyranny. They got him in jail, they wanted to execute him. The guy ran away, went to Sparta, gave him the advice which took Athens out of history. And Athens did not exist as an empire after that. So basically this was a perfectly democratic decision. However, however it was a perfectly wrong decision. Yeah. Now. Democracy is a good thing. You have your share in doing things. However, you must have some controls of a democracy. And you, you must, in my opinion, and I, I emphasized on the fact that this is my opinion, what I tend to believe. I may be absolutely wrong. I may be absolutely right. Who knows? It's for you and for the listeners to decide. Now, democracy has to have some technocratic controls around it. Otherwise, you will lose everything. Otherwise, if, if the people decide in each and every matter, it will not work because not everyone is a military, for example. How are you going to decide in a military thing if you're not a military? Yeah, or economy. Or yeah, it's like having a vote in the neighborhood for how you run your radio station. Crazy. Now, I can't give you, give you a straight opinion like, okay, this is good, this is bad, like things, doesn't, things don't work this way. However, I think that the idea that pure democracy pure democracy is like the perfect system I don't know like you're going you're going straight against the, the human nature like pure democracy we all have our shares but who says what are what are our intentions you have a lot of examples in uh, after the Arab Spring for example in the Arab world you have a lot of examples where people uh, where elections were played with through people's needs for example through what Al-Farabi later on calls it the necessity the system of necessity so, for example, I go to a poor village and I say, hey, look, I'm going to give you some food aids. So I'm going to give you some uh, oil, some sugar, some, I don't know, meat, right? And I want you to come next week and vote for me, right? And maybe people who are not, Ill who are illiterate, literally, and they say, okay, you should just go to this sign, just choose this sign, this symbol, and do this. And they go. And then... In the elections, you'd find that this party won. However, you know that this party, for example, has no popularity whatsoever among the intellectuals. And you look at that result and you're like, how did they win? This is how they win. Uh, this is how, how they won, basically. So it's not a perfect system. And to, assu to assume that it is a perfect system, it's crazy. It's like saying communism is a perfect system. It's not a perfect system. If you say democracy uh, alone, without any controls, is a perfect system, it's exactly as saying communism is a perfect system. Yeah, I mean, lots of people take a democracy or the term democracy as a sacred ideology, like exactly. a sacred concept. Exactly. And anything other than uh, democracy, it must be evil because it's uh, enforcing your opinion. But what if my opinion is right? You know, what if? Exactly. I don't care about. You know, I don't. I, don't yeah. I just care about what's right. What's uh, what's right and what's wrong. I also care about the consequences because yeah. a lot of people uh, put a lot of value into concepts and they don't think about the consequences. Yeah. What what you're going the, the law or the policy that you're yeah. gonna put. Are we gonna get good things out of it or bad things out of it? In that case, you get in another discussion. In that case, if you say, okay, look, democracy has its negative points, but it's the best so far. Let me tell you something. Let's suppose that we're going to take this idea, right? We don't want democracy. We want someone who decides, like we can hold him responsible, right? So we want someone who can decide fast. Al-Farabi spoke about exactly this idea, and he spoke about the philosopher ruler and the prophet ruler, and he was indicating at Muhammad, peace be upon him. Right. And then he said, uh, because Muhammad, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, if you think about it, he was a prophet legislator. So he was a prophet and he was legislating how life should be. So you shouldn't do this, you should do this, you shouldn't do this, you should do this. Now, Al-Farabi said that, okay, if we, uh, 
if we decide to, to make such a system where there is one person who rules, this person has to be perfectly a philosopher, so perf perfectly activated in terms of rational thinking, or perfectly a prophet. So he's a person who receives divine things, right? So he's perfectly a prophet. Now, in both cases, in both cases, can you guarantee that this person exists, exists today? You don't. Okay, let's suppose theoretically that this person exists and he's the head of this city or this nation or call it whatever you want right let's suppose that he's good he does all of, he does his job great the country is great he died who's gonna come after him his son mm. or maybe his friend or who's gonna come after him now al-farabi got a solution to that he said we can drop prophecy because prophecy and it's really rare to find a prophet right so we can drop prophecy however we can't drop rationality so we should keep rationality, right? And we should, if if um, if prophecy is to be replaced, it should be replaced by someone who can judge the situation and make legislations correct to that way. exactly, but that exactly, exist. exactly. So he said, s if these things cannot be in one person, we can rule as a group. And so this is where the idea of a committee of ruling a country came from, or a committee of ruling a city came from. However, if you go out of democracy. We agree that democracy, uh, it has some limitations, let's call them. But if you go out of democracy, the, the possible or potential consequences of tyranny are way worse than, than the potential consequences of democracy. So uh, democracy would be like the, um, the best of the two bads, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. Exactly, exactly. At least, you get, uh, at least you get the freedom to do the art that you know how to do. At least you're not controlled at that aspect, so you get the freedom to, to, uh, to be creative. However, even in democracy, once you think about it, you have different kinds of democracy. It's crazy. It takes you to a lot of subjects. No, but, but that's true. I mean, historically speaking, I think democracy hasn't caused much damage in comparison. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure, for Maybe sure. Maybe it killed scientists and that really hurts. Yeah. But not like tyranny where, they, where, they, there, are, there, were genocides and uh, uh, Yeah, at least it killed them in the name of the people. Now, it's crazy to say that. Uh, that's crazy. I mean, Socrates was killed in the name uh, of the people. Yeah, that's crazy. However, however, democracy still in these days, with all of the developments that we had, that we had during the the last centuries, democracy still is still the best of the two bads. I told you. Um, even in democracy, you have different types of democracy. Like you have liberal democracy, social democracy. Like you have different types of democracy. Yeah. I, I, no one can give you a clear, a clear. Uh, clear opinion concerning think about things. the elites when, when when saying that maybe it's the elites who need to judge yeah. between them no we're not gonna make this judgment um, on the hands of all people but at yeah. least on the hands of the elites yeah. and then we talk about the Algerian elites who yeah. are the Algerian elites are there the uh, professors at universities yeah, who are teaching question. us or uh, are there like the social activists out uh, there yelling about like yeah. human rights and everything um, uh, are there the rich people yeah. who who, who who are we going to give the legitimacy to judge on uh, behalf of us? Give it to the institution. Why should you give it to people? Mm. Give it to an, inst an institution which has a system that you already know. And then the institution is going to do things. And then when that person who you think is an elite dies, another person will come and the institution will keep working. Why, why, why is it obligatory to give it to a person in specific? Like a state that... It is even part of the definition of political stability. Uh, stable institutions, stable mechanisms of, of, uh, of reaching to power and leaving power, that's political stability. Institutions, you don't have to give it to people at all. And when you say elites, uh, that's so relative. Like uh, what? Uh, who Intellectual you elite or sport elite. Who you elite. consider elite may be considered not for other people. But there is something there. I think in Algeria, yeah. we don't we talked about this last time. Yeah. Sometimes you disagree, for example, uh, with the professor. Yeah. But he acknowledged that he's one of the elites. He's one of, of the most knowledgeable people. But of here, course. do you remember the example that I gave about Guardiola? He said, like, he's not trained. Uh, yeah, yeah. You disagree with him. It's not like he's not trained. Of course, of course. You disagree. By the way, we talked about Think that about last time because I know that people are yeah. listening to this podcast with it now. We talked about how Algerians criticize uh, 
yeah. uh, people or players or whatever. So, for example, in Mo if Manchester City is playing and then they lose, instead of saying, uh, like, for example, the, the um, I don't know, like the, the trainer is just uh, was wrong in that strategy or something, someone would say, like, uh, he's not trainer at all. Or, yeah. for example, if someone yeah. doesn't like uh, Cristiano Ronaldo or Messi, yeah. instead of saying, oh, I don't like uh, the way he plays, he says he's not a player. Yeah. Like, how come he's not a player? He is a player. It's just that you disagree with how he plays. Like, those two different things. Yeah. And so, there are, for example, elites in society. Of yeah. course, you can disagree with their opinions. Yeah. But maybe you still acknowledge that they are on the top of what we have on society mm, okay. in terms of knowledge. Okay, fair enough. Now, uh, look, let's take the example of Guardiola first. Then we're going to go to the elites, fine. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about Guardiola. Why do you disagree with Gu Guardiola? You disagree because the result was bad. So no, but because of also the plan. You think that maybe if he... Uh, executed I another plan that was in your mind uh -huh. things would have been better. Great, what if he won that game with the same plan? You would, you would say would you genius. criticize the plan? Yeah, of course you would not. You wouldn't, fine. So what you're criticizing basically is the consequence of that plan. You're not criticizing the plan. Because if we go to, to if we go to the level of the plan you have no idea how plans are made in football and if you do you have a superficial one because you have never had an experience training any other team. So how, how would you know? Now there, there's a French philosopher who, sp who speaks about this and he says like, okay, it's easy to say uh, I can train a team. I can go and train the team, right? But once you're there and you're waiting for the team and the time it's and the training, it's a whole different issue. So what, basically what you are uh, objecting to is the consequence. Like the consequence made you angry. And now when you're angry, Let's talk about another concept, which is great. In psychology, there, is, there are two attitudes for a person, right? <coughs> now, there is the explicit attitude, and there is the implicit attitude. The explicit attitude is what I say to you. Like, hey, you look good today, for example. So that means my explicit attitude is that I like your look. But maybe I can say you look good today, but inside of me I say you look awful today. So this is my implicit. Those are like intentions. Exactly. Not intentions, an implicit attitude. But something, something is not allowing my implicit attitude to, to go out. Maybe you're my manager. So I would say maybe, I don't know, maybe you're, um, I don't know. Okay? <coughs> now, when you're angry, what happens is that those barriers between the implicit and the explicit, they disappear. And then certain regions of your brain, they deactivate temporarily. And what happens is that this barrier is off. And so when you're angry, you're saying things that you don't want to say. And you later on, you, you regret what you said when you're angry. That's why they tell you when you're angry, be quiet, don't speak. Right. So when this disappears, when you're angry, there are two things which happened inside of you. The first one is that you don't agree with the consequence. You don't agree with the result, which is right in front of you. You don't agree with it. That's why you're angry. The second thing, you think that you know what's, be what's best, what was supposed to be done. Yes. Right. So at that point, you're in a higher moral place in your perception concerning the hour comparing to the other. So now you start screaming and saying whatever you want because you think he's inferior. He made a mistake. You know what's the right solution for this. And now you're bombarding this person. Right. Now, when you're angry about Guardiola, you feel like you're here. You start bombarding Guardiola personally. Right. However, if I put you in Guardiola in an examination about training, you will fail and he will pass. You have to, you have, we have to distinguish between being, <coughs> between criticizing the consequences or criticizing the results of the situation and criticizing the person or the situation or even um, laying responsibility on people. Like you're responsible for this. You're responsible for that. Now, maybe I'm listening to ABP. Maybe I don't like what ABB produces, right? So I would be objecting on the results of your production, yeah. right? But does that give me the right to come to a hub and say, you know nothing in running radios? Of course not. Because if I say that, you have two presuppositions. The first one, I know how to run a radio. Because if I'm telling you that you don't, that means I know how to run a radio and I think you, you're not sure. good at, at it. Second thing, I have the alternative. So you don't know how to run the radio. This is not put like that. Uh, you should not put this like that. You should put it like that. So I know the solution. I know the alternative. Right. In most of the cases that you see on Facebook, for example, do you think 
those who write these critiques about uh, this administration should do that and this person should do that. Do you think they know how the process goes? They don't. Okay, do you think they know what is the alternative solution? They don't have a solution. Then but here comes... There are, there are a lot of, they have an argument. They say that it's not my job to, to, uh, to produce the solution. It's also not your job to speak about things that you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> it's also not your job to speak about things that you don't know. Now the question, the real question, which emerges from all of this, will have. If you don't know, if you don't know exactly what you're talking about, right, and you don't have an alternative solution, why are you speaking? Like, okay, whether you blame them or you support them, fine. However, the question remains, why do they do that? Now, let me ask you a question. If you are the first human on Earth, you are the first human on Earth, right, and there is Facebook, would you sign up? So There's no other humans. Yeah. There's no other humans. Mm -hmm. Would you sign up for Facebook? I wouldn't. Twitter? I would not. Maybe Instagram? Of course no. I wouldn't. Okay, no fine. one is going to like or comment. Uh, or exactly. It has to have the interaction. Exactly. So basically, Facebook has a certain social uh, significance. Uh, writing on Facebook in general has a social significance. Now, the thing is that if I am writing without knowing the procedure, without having an, an alternative solution, that means I'm writing for another reason. And since if people disappear, I will not be writing. So basically I'm writing for a reason which is related to the people. Now, if I write something and people say, hey, great, what you're saying is great, what you're saying is good, what you're saying is right, I will continue writing. Right. If I write something and I find that, I, that most of the people said, I stop this credulity, man, you, you're absolutely mistaken. I will stop. Right. Unless if I have a, a self-control, right. So, what I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes the objective of this post is not really the information. The objective is to tell you that he's smarter than the lawmaker, he's smarter than Guardiola, he's smarter than whoever he is criticizing, right? And that you should listen to him because he's smarter. This is the whole thing. He's trying to draw a beautiful social sphere around him that I am good, I'm, I'm intellectual, I know things. However, if you ask him to organize his ideas in one text, which is organized normally like arguments and normally, like an argument, a premise and an argument and everything, I double challenge you. Uh, in most of the cases, in m not all of them, not all of them, I have to be clear, not all of them. Some of them, they really write good arguments. And you don't have to have a degree from the university to be, to be a specialist in something, by the way. Uh, in the old times, no one, uh, university, did, university didn't even exist, and people were specialists That's in some true, cases. Yeah. Yes, so uh, you, can, you can be autodetect in, the, in, in these things. However, in most of the cases, I challenge you if they know the least about the procedure that they are criticizing. All right. Yeah. Uh, so there is also another topic that I really wanted uh, to have a discussion with yeah. you about. Yeah. It's actually the dilemma. Uh, of <coughs> English and French in Algeria, and French being uh, portrayed as an evil language and as a really, yeah. and sometimes, um, sometimes it's like when people speak French, they directly blame them, yeah. and uh, people say that's stupid, that's uh, bad, um, mm. that's wrong. I agree with that, but I agree with it to some extent because I think that there are uh, underlying factors. That's like the tip of yeah. the iceberg. There yeah. are certain factors that led people to yeah. think of French than just more than just language. Uh. In its essence, it's just language. It's uh, like any yeah. other language in the world. But the way it is used in society yeah. is different. And so that's yeah. what makes probably people angry when they see others speaking in French. Yeah. Um, probably when someone is, uh, let's say, Mas'ul, like chief or something, yeah. uh, responsible over something, they talk to people in mm. French and they don't know. Last time they put someone on TV and it was like, I wish they was talking in French and uh, yeah. they didn't put any subtitles or anything like that. It's like all Algerians understand yeah. French. They don't, yeah. they don't, they don't all understand French. They don't, yeah. Exactly. And so I was just, I was saying, I wish I was responsible over that media. Uh. I'm going to put uh, someone to translate and I'm going to do that in purpose. Subtitles? In no, not subtitles. Uh. I'm going to use subtitles. I'm going to do it just like BN Sport. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be, be crazy, yeah. yeah. It would be fun. Yeah. And it also sends a message. Of course. That you're actually talking in a foreign language. 
Exactly. And you're going to look like a fo like a, like someone from a foreign country, exactly. even though you, you're not. Yeah. Uh, I understand that you might say, "Hey, I am um, an honest person. I'm a good person. I really want to work. Uh, I really want to do well." Yeah. It's just that I'm more comfortable with French. Yeah. Well. I'm also comfortable with English, but I don't talk to people in English exactly. because they wouldn't understand. Yeah. So why do you not apply the same thing to French? I know that maybe your network or your or the people that you hang out with, most of them yeah. they know French. But yeah. if you go, for example, to a lot of other wilayas, if you um, talk to young people who never, for example, got the yeah. chance to go to university, and there <coughs> are a lot of them, yeah. they cannot. They don't yeah. know French. So why do you? Are you uh, do you want the message to be delivered? Do you want to communicate with people, or you just want to be comfortable in your uh, own zone? Um, so that's the question. Okay, now that takes us back to the first matter that we spoke about. Why do they uh, say no on social media? Why do they speak French in a, in a country or in a place where some people have difficulty with it? Now, is it only to transmit the message? like in the first case that we spoke about is it only to say that i'm against this because i know tak 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 now let's go to this case do i speak french to people to convey the message now you have to distinguish clear things in our society before we go to that after independence like shortly after independence you have to know that we did not have any technocratic uh human resource whatsoever whatsoever because most of them went to France, like some of the French engineers and the French everything w who were present in Algeria during the, the, the colonization, they went back to France. And then the only, the only people who were purely technocrat at that point of time were the francophones, like the Algerian francophones who were present here. Right. And as you know, and as everyone knows, uh, like the French colonization tried its maximum to eliminate the, the, the local na languages or cultures, or they tried to limit these cultures to the villages or to the countryside and to keep it away from the cities. So what happened later on is that like, you, can't, you can't generally blame the political administration at that time for not yeah, introducing course. the Arabic because he had no other option. Uh, there, there's an Algerian writer who was, I think, in the position of a mayor, a uh, freak, something freak. Uh, he's from Oran. Uh, he wrote a book about this, uh, the, fr the, fr the francophonization of the Algerian administration. And he said, uh, like, he spoke about the whole story. In some ministries it worked, like the justice, for example. In the Ministry of Justice today, you can't find any document which is written in French. Right. Now, back to the ID. Do I speak in? Do I speak French to communicate with you, or do I speak French to send the message that I am in a higher social position than you, or do I speak French because my mother spoke to me only in French, and I grew up in a family which speaks only French, so I turned out to be speaking French, right? Now in the third case, where the, the whole family speaks French, this is not his fault. This is absolutely not yeah, of course. that if you can consider it a fault in the first place, but it's not his. This is his environment. This is how he grew up. However, some people, they use French to send the message that we are higher than you culturally. And this happens in the university, for example, when you try to speak French. I'm not a francophone, by the way. I, I don't really speak French that good. Now, in the university, in my first years, I tried to I tried to learn French because this is what I had to do. Like the university, I studied biology, and biology in Algeria it's in French. So I tried to express myself in French, and at every single mistake, someone was laughing. And at that point of time, like uh, you don't have really the rational thinking to say that okay, let him laugh. I'm developing. You don't. At that point, you say, God, I should stop this. Yeah, like you, I should feel you feel embarrassed, you feel bad. You feel embarrassed, you feel bad. You say, like, okay, I should stop this thing. Right. Back at that time, there were, uh, English was not really of a great fame in Algeria. Like, people were not moving towards English Look, that much. this happened to you while you were a student of biology, while yeah. you were someone who read books, who knows the academia, who yeah. knows things, and you felt embarrassed. Imagine yeah. someone who never went to university. How would they feel? Because they feel they're really in the bottom of society. Let me tell you something. If someone does this to you, speak in Arabic. Speak in Arabic. Like, speak to him in Fusha, if you can. If you can't, speak in Arabic. Like, he gave you a language that you can't, under uh, you can't understand. Fine, give him a language that he can't understand. Yeah, you have, say for example. English. They people say, the people say, like, you can speak in English. But I don't see the point. I don't see this point of competition. It's just uh, weird that we're like that. Mm. You guys just need to understand that this is... We're just communicating. We're trying to... Yeah. to 
sometimes it happens between and what, what I wonder about the most. I understand people who are comfortable with it. Yeah. I understand. But when you're comfortable with it, speak it with your friends, with your family, but not when you're in a position, for example, yeah. to deal with people. We have this weird concept that we, we have misunderstanding you know, with when we think about the, 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 the concept of uh, con consumer, what do we call it? Consumer, consumer consumer service yeah okay we don't have the culture of consumer service yeah. okay consumer of consumer service means that you're 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 given a service to the consumer yeah. to the client okay yeah, yeah. so you tr uh, yeah, this is what happens like when you're hired people yeah. ask you do you speak arabic because the, those people speak yeah. arabic do you speak french because there are people who speak french okay yeah. you're hired so you are hired to yeah. communicate with people based on the language that people are comfortable with, exactly. not based on the language that you are comfortable exactly. with. Exactly. So if you're in a head of administration, you have an office where you receive people, yeah. why would you try to speak to them in French even though you know that they don't understand? Let me ask and you, you can yeah. see that they don't understand. And let me ask you something. Can you get a job in Algeria if you don't speak French? Is it easy? Uh, at it, least it, it's not. Is it's, it easy? It's a very challenge, especially if you're ambitious. Okay, especially no. if you want something now. Now, if you have French, you can speak French, <coughs> but you cannot write French perfectly. Yes. Is it easy to find a job? Uh, it's not. It's not. Fine. Why? Like, why would I have a challenge uh, finding a job because I don't have in French? In my country. In my country. In my own country. In my own yeah. country, which is crazy. In my own country. But listen, we have to be fair. It works on both ways. Like it's not only the francophones. And by the way, you should, you sh we should really, really, really distinguish between a francophone and a francophile. Yes, that's we that's should good really idea. exactly. We should really distinguish between both of them. And you have to admit that the same phenomena is emerging in English speakers. We have anglophones and we have something else. Mm. So we should really be careful. What do we call them anglophile. I am. Uh, English full I rather I rather abstain from from making the term but in general uh, you have francophones and you have francophones now there's no problem whatsoever to be a francophone like, great that's a great thing even if you don't speak French go and become a francophone that's great it's an additional language of who course, says no yeah, of course. yeah but to become a francophile and try to apply the same filters of the French society which I respect I don't disrespect the French society like it's okay it's their society they can live however they want like yeah. it's not my business at all but to, to bring these filters of the French society and to apply them to the Algerian society and then to say that okay according to these filters which are not Algerian even you're not civilized you're civilized you're a good person you you're good for work you're not good for work i think it's 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 normal and it's okay if you pick the good things but when you try to pick the whole package even the cultural things that uh that uh, we cannot judge if they are good or bad they're just uh they're just filters of the french they're french yeah paul sartre wrote the introduction of a book of france fanon the uh, the wrath in earth i think it was the name and he was speaking about this idea and he was saying like the french colonization at a certain point of time realized that uh, they're not gonna stay in algeria for long and uh, uh, unless they they change their methods in here so they had this beautiful idea and they said okay let's take some of the children some of the teens of the algerians and let's take them to france and we're gonna educate them in the french like according to the French education, we're going to bring them back to the country and then they will rule the country. Uh, basically, they will rule in our favor because we formed them in the way that we want. They will rule in our favor and everything will be good. And they did that, basically. They took people, to, they took young people, in fact, to France and they brought them back and everything. When they brought them back, they discovered that these boys that they took were totally separated from the society because the society could not understand these people. These people were speaking French and were speaking everything. And the society, they were like, uh, they were forced out of intellect at all. They, like they were, they were oppressed totally, right? So uh, basically, those new, like those um, made-up elite, they're mixed with the society, right? And when they didn't mix with the society, they deemed the villages and the countryside to be the bad ones responsible for this problem, right? Not themselves, not the colonization and Sartre was talking about that and he said whenever we said for example whenever we said freedom you could hear Edom 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 in Asia and Africa these people like he said these young people they don't even know what we're talking about however they're repeating what they heard from us right That's so, so deep. yeah this is exactly this is exactly where the problem of the term of 
Kavi came from in Algeria. It came from the fact that the, the cities were separated from the countryside and the, the ones who were in the city and were like the ones who were absorbed by France, by the French occupation, uh -huh. of course, or French colonization, they saw themselves to be like the great, uh, the high elite. This is why before I told you, like, you have to define elite before you tell me who's elite and who's not. Yeah, at that time, these people were the elite. And then they became the high elite. And then if you talk, take a look at the countryside, you discover that they are oppressed. They don't go to schools. They only work in farming. They only work in all, diff all different things. And then this elite, this mayor of elite, started calling this one a barbarian. He called them all kinds of things. He's a barbarian, he's not an educated man, he sticks to, to the social traditions which we should throw in the garbage. Now, you can be against them, you can be with them, but some of them is, is valuable until, like, up until now, uh, it's valuable. Some of them, yeah, they're not, but some of them are. However, the, the question here is not about these traditions. The question is about this idea of, of elite. What do you define as elite? If you define yourself as elite according to the language, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, but I think that there is uh, something, a remark that, I, that we should make here. Uh, yeah. I think that also the educational system, uh, university system, yeah. um, since it's in French, yeah. so the people who are filtered to be educated yeah. are going to be French speakers. Mm. You know? Because if you don't master French well, and for example, in a biology class or some class where all the subjects are in French and you have to present and no, do okay. research and everything, then maybe you won't, you won't pass all the years and, for example, get a PhD, okay. for example. You and so the ones who will get a PhD, of course, they're going to be uh, francophones. Okay, great. Do we teach psychology in French? We don't. No. Do we teach sociology in French? We mm. don't. Yeah. Law? No. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Economy? No. No, I'm not we teach only scientific. Wait a minute, I'm saying it's all due to the education. No, no, no. The because there are historical... And that's not the point. That's not the point. Just wait for me. Look, go to the street and go to these people who study in Arabic. Tell them to tell you the alphabet of the Arabic language in order. You'll be amazed. It's not about the education 100%. It's about your interest. People, some people inside the society are planting in our minds that Arabic is not a language that you can produce anything scientific or intellectual with. And this idea has been emphasized by the realities around us, like most of the reviews are in English. Yeah. Now, let me tell you, tell you a personal experience. I had a French professor in Greece. He was called Lapierre. Now, Lapierre was a, was a, he was a great professor. He was a professor of uh, toxicology toxicology. More specifically, he's a professor of neurotoxicology. That professor was French, okay? He came to teach us a course for one week and he was leaving. And so the teacher got in the, the, the hall, like the, the amphitheater where he was supposed to teach us. He was like, good morning, my name is Lapierre. Today I'm going to teach you this and this. It is very important to do. And then the French Lapierre was talking English. And now you cannot touch Lapierre, like academically, he's great. Like he's in, an, in a whole other level. However, think about it. Even, even a French professor realizes that English now is the language of science, whether you like it or not. At every point of history, there was a language which was a universal language of science. At a certain point of history, Arabic was a language of, of, of the sciences because we translated from the Greeks and the Indians and the Persians. And then we, d we developed the whole thing in the Abbasid and the Amawi. Uh, time and so puts, yeah. exactly exactly so basically we built some body of intellect then the mongols came and then the library of baghdad was all dropped in the ifrates and then everything is gone next thing that happened latin took place and after latin you have english now you have to be a real uh, you have to be like really realistic about this for now english is the language of science it's not french why do we keep it here that's a very very deep question that's a very deep question like you can't you can't possibly you can not get rid of a, of a language that was implanted for long years that people were using it for long even as you said like the elites that we had uh, after the independence for mm -hmm. example most of them the elites in the sense of in the educational yeah. system and, yeah um in academia like most of them like the, 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 for example, like uh, most lar lot of Algerian writers and mm -hmm. others, for example, wrote in French. They didn't know another other language. 
But I have a problem when people say that uh, this language is like a part of Algerian history. No. And for me, it's like, or Algerian heritage. Like, mm -hmm. when you say heritage, I feel like you're trying to associate yourself. Also yeah. associate something to yeah. your culture. That's not from your culture. Speak Turkish and if it's, it's part of the heritage. Yeah, it's just like, and it, it's, it, like it sounds so pathetic. Like, yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. People, the French were forcing people to go to study the language yeah. or, to, um, or to go to French schools, for example. Mm -hmm. They didn't allow Arabic schools because they... And, and, and that's why, for example, those writers wrote in French. That's why they yeah. all They didn't know. They didn't have yeah. a choice. Yeah. And now you have a choice. And you're choosing the same path. You know what's crazy? That person who tells you that French is part of our heritage, he tells you in the same conversation that Arabic is not. Exactly. <laughs> Which is crazy. <laughs> Which is absolutely crazy. It's weird. Like how, uh, how do you make the distinction? I think that yeah. I think that the society, the Algerian society, yeah. uh, it's like those those um, those problems that we see. I think that they, as I told you in the beginning, they are the tip yeah. of the iceberg. Yeah. There is like huge iceberg in, uh, underneath, and yeah. huge impulses and unsaid unsaid thoughts yeah. and opinions, yeah. and they're only gonna come up when you go through those conversations, those, yeah. those controversial yeah. topics. Yeah, I Arabic think not. Like, what the hell? Do you, and then they tell you, but the Arabic was like a colonization. Wait a minute, that was one thousand years ago. Uh, and we are not even sure that it was a colonization. French was love, like French came with love. If you refuse Arabic because it's a, it's a, it, it came with colon with a certain type of colonization as you as you perceive it. Do you have any idea? How did French come to Algeria with love, with love letters? Like, obviously, it came with another colonization. And if if French, uh, let me tell something. Let's suppose, let's take this, this notion like, okay, French is part of the Algerian heritage because the French were here, right? Okay, why don't you speak Turkish? Why don't you speak Latin? Augustine, he was from Annaba. You know that, yeah? Augustine, Augustine of Hippo. Hippo is Annaba today. Augustine, who was of Rome, he was from Annaba. He was born in Annaba. Okay, why don't we speak Latin also? You have some, you have some languages that you agree I told you the problem is deeper. You have some languages that we agree commonly to use between us as languages of communication. The language itself is not an objective. It's a means. I use it to, to communicate with you. If I'm communicating with Wahab in French and Wahab doesn't understand, I should change the language to a language which is common between me and him. I shouldn't say Wahab should learn the language because I have the option he doesn't. Maybe I have the option of having two languages. Well, how doesn't he knows only one language? Maybe. That's okay. true. I mean, when I talk about people who, about the French, they be say, humble. They say they they should go to to learn it. It's like why do they sh why should they go to learn it if they want to study in their own country or get a job in their own country? Why? Maybe they don't have the means. For example, they can't pay for a private school. Mm -hmm. They can't go mm -hmm. to school. Maybe they they're not attracted to it. You know, you should have the option to study any language. For example, I like German. Yeah. You know, yeah. I don't. Uh, I don't. It's, it's like, in one hand, you yeah. tell me that it's just language like other languages, mm. and on the other hand, you don't treat it as a language just like the, like the other language. You treat it as yours. Exactly. Uh, uh, look, when you form a state, you basically form a state or a country based on a certain notion of identity. So, for example. If you want to build a unified identity of the state, you would say we are Algerians, right? We are Algerians. We have one identity. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter which wilaya. It doesn't matter which tribe. It doesn't matter which. Okay, we are Algerians, and you can't, you can't possibly, you cannot, possibly deny that this country was at, at its beginning a Mazir. Just to be yeah. clear about this, you cannot deny this. You cannot possibly deny this if you have any notion of history about Algeria, that this country at the beginning was Hamazir. And then a lot of mixtures happened with the Romans, with the Arabs, with the Spanish, with the Turkish, with the French, with a lot of mixtures happened and we emerged as Algerians. So we should really stick to to being Algerians more than we stick to being whatever Shilha or Shabi or yeah. Kabil or Arab. Ahmed, I want to ask you, in the, uh, in the circle of youth, leaders yeah. and activists and i guess that you are in that circle okay i got yeah. to know you in me one with a yeah but i'm not a leader <laughs> I, I know yeah well maybe you are i, I don't know no i don't think so <laughs> okay i know it was uh, too quick it's like no i don't know if you're a leader no. uh, yeah okay so 
that you you we both know um, a lot of people in the field and everything. Yeah. And uh, we we want to encourage that passion for society to do good and everything. What do you think yeah. are the uh, what do you think what we lack in 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 this in this field exactly? We lack no load the knowledge that we don't know. Because we, once you did the video when you were saying that like before um, the video that you posted in ABP actually yeah. you were talking about how like we need before we try to preach yeah. and tell people yeah. uh, about what's the right way, we should also be critical with ourselves and, and ask ourselves, is that really the right way? Because we yeah. should also fear um, misleading people, you know? Yeah, yeah, because uh, it's called intellectual responsibility. Because you're criticizing certain things mm. and uh, you want to replace it with something else. Maybe the thing that you're yeah. trying to replace it with is actually worse, you know? Yeah, you have to make sure, look, the thing is that before before you go ahead and try to convince people with something, you have to be sure that y what you're trying to convince them with is true. Simple. The thing, uh, the thing that we really need is the knowledge that we don't know. We need to realize that we don't know a lot of things. Right. Uh, w let me tell you something. Let me tell you a small story. In 2018, this in fact happened to me. Um, I basically discovered that all of what I called knowledge that I had was an illusion. Simple. Now, uh, why I discovered that? Because, like, I discovered a new path where where you have to you have to basically prove everything that you say, and you have to prove like every phrase that you write. You have to put a reference and all of that. And then I was like, God, uh, I know I thought this was true. It isn't. Thank God I thought this was true, and it isn't. And then basically what happened is that I realized that I don't know a lot of things right. At that point, if you noticed even on, on my social media, I got quiet. I stopped posting anything until this day, if you if you notice. I got quiet, I stopped publishing. But what, like the feeling at that moment was extremely painful. Like you feel that out of a sudden you're lost. Like you had some kind of light. I know this thing. I know that thing. I know that thing. Out of a sudden, you're lost, and you don't know not you know nothing. You discover that you know nothing, even the simplest thing, playing guitar, for example. I thought that I know how to play guitar. I discovered that I don't. Right. And then when I was, well, n now I'm trying to learn guitar. Like look, I hurt my finger. You can see it even here. But now when I'm trying to learn, I discover that I really don't. It is so painful. However, at that point of time, congrats, you have been liberated. You will be so, you will feel such freedom that right after being lost, you will feel like you are dropped in a sea of knowledge. And then you're just trying to drink as much as you can. Simple, right? So once you know that you don't know, first of all, you will lose the problems with the team because then you will be listening to people because they may know something that you don't. So you will lose the problems with the team, mostly, unless you're a rude person in, the, in that case. <laughs> like, I don't know what, yeah, uh, what yeah, yeah. Second, when you take a decision, you will take a decision which is at least based on a certain foundation. It may be a wrong decision, but at least it's based on the right foundation. Three, you will be more humble in your speaking with the people. You will be more humble with the social media. Right, so I think that what we like now is this, because if you go deep inside um, this movement, you will find people standing on stages. And uh, I think you know Abdullah Abu Diaf, yes? Yes, yeah. uh, the psychologist? Yes, he's a psychologist, he's a great psychologist. He, he, he has this great program. I'm actually on thinking about uh, having him. Yeah, 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 that would be lovely. Uh, he has a great program. He, he, sp he speaks about psychological things on, on social media. Now. Yesterday, Abdullah posted something and he said, uh, he said, I listen, guys, if you're looking for someone who teaches uh, public speaking, I'm not there. I'm not going to participate in that. And that raised a big like uh, that. That reminded me of something. Believe me, you go to conferences and you find people standing on stage and they're talking. Believe me, they're exactly like those on social media who write without knowing anything. What they do is that they copy past, they copy something from his here, they pass it to the to the presentation, and then they present it, and the stage is so uh, deceptuous. The state, 
deceives you. <coughs> when someone is on the stage, people will suppose that he knows. People will suppose already there that he knows what he's talking about. However, he doesn't. Now, I'm sitting with you on this table. If someone is watching this video and he sees like a suit, I don't know, a suit or this thing or the radio, he will suppose that I know. I don't. I'm basically telling you what I tend to believe. I can tell you what I tend to believe as a person. So people judge based on appearances a lot. Don't even, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, suppose that I'm lying. Suppose that everything that I said in here was a lie. Go do, do the research. Go check what I'm saying. If it's true, fine. If yeah, it's false. I mean, it's a few people who do that. People usually, okay, so people usually judge people based on their clothes based on their car, yeah. based on their titles, like what do you work, based yeah. on how you look, based on language, which language you're speaking with, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so those are all superficial. You can find people with great, great car, great dress, <laughs> whatever, big titles, but they actually don't know what you're saying. You shouldn't follow them because you follow them, you're going to hell. Yeah. Um, so you yeah. marry him and you get divorced after one year. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's another problem. When you marry someone based on, I don't know, you marry someone based on the look, for example. If you, you, mar if you get married with the woman just because of uh, the looks, you're screwed. Oh, of course, if you marry a man based on the same thing, you're screwed. Yeah, of, yeah, of course. It's the same thing. You can't say man or woman in this case. Okay, so I mean, before wrapping up, do you want? Uh, do you have anything else like you wanna say? I, I think to wrap this up, I think like the main message I wanted to pass through this is, please, please, first of all, have some intellectual responsibility before you speak about anything second of all um, be careful with your social media be careful with your social media those people who just criticize for criticizing they are really toxic and you should really throw them off the off your back three get ready for that moment when you discover that you don't know that will be the greatest moment of your life, life. the greatest moment of your life I think this is the message I wanted to pass. Don't trust people based on their looks and what they say and how fancy and how elegant is their, are their words on the post like that. It's crazy. I can write in Fusha with the elegant words and write nonsense. And you would think like, oh, he's, a, he's an artist. He's a, I don't know, he's a scientist. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm a guy who memorizes good. Like I can memorize that thing and I can write it. That's it. I think this is the most important thing. Uh, intellectual responsibility. Don't trust these people. Understand things around you. Trust me, you don't know. Trust me. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Whatever you think that you're really an expert in it, trust me, you don't know. Go do some more search. You will never have perfect knowledge. Never. Only him has that, not us. That's dope, man. Uh, been great yeah. talking to you. Thank you very much. And that's it, guys. Take care of yourself and have a good day. Bye-bye.